Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, body positivity, and health at every size. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and certified intuitive eating counselor specializing in weight-inclusive wellness. Join me as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships with food. Uh I I, I remember I was teething, little gums bleeding, Friday evening, it was all about eating. When I became a teen, it was all about beef, and now I'm ready for the world. Try and sink my teeth in, stacking it. Hey, welcome to episode 80 of Food Psych. I am, of course, your host, Christy Harrison. And today I'm talking with Marcy Evans, who is a fabulous colleague of mine, a fellow dietitian who specializes in eating disorders and health at every size. And we had such a lovely conversation, and I'm excited to share it with you today because since Thanksgiving was last week, this is now sort of the official start of the holiday season. And people tend to start freaking out a little bit around the holiday season, right? I know I did when I was in my disordered relationship with food. I would eat a lot of the sweets that were around and the fun different holiday foods that I had restricted myself of for the rest of the year. And I would feel out of control and I would feel like I was addicted to food and I couldn't stop and there was something wrong with me. So I wanted to bring this episode to you today at the start of the holiday season because it's about food addiction. We get into why food addiction isn't really a thing, but why people still feel addicted to food. And it's got some really helpful advice for helping you navigate that feeling. And Marcy also has some really helpful wisdom to share about just developing a healthy relationship with food in general and some really helpful wisdom for fellow dietitians and professionals in the health field on how to treat eating disorders and the sort of ins and outs of that as well. So there's a lot of great material here and I can't wait to share it with you all in just a moment. First, I want to share a couple great resources for helping you improve your relationship with food. The first is my free quiz to assess if you have a healthy relationship with food, and I'll send you your results via email along with more than a dozen individualized tips to help you make peace with food wherever you may fall on the spectrum right now. So you can take the quiz and get your results today at christyharrison.com slash quiz. That's christyharrison.com slash quiz. The second resource I want to share is my Intuitive Eating Fundamentals online course. It's a 13-week program that I created to help you work through all the principles of intuitive eating in depth and really troubleshoot and overcome some of the major hurdles that I see people go through when they're trying to learn intuitive eating. So I'll teach you how to recognize the diet mentality, even in its subtle forms. This is the area of the course that people have the most consistent revelations and transformations around because they'll often say to me like, oh my God, I never realized how much the diet mentality is hanging on. Like these lingering thoughts and you know things that I wasn't even consciously aware of, I'm now aware of and I can work on and change. So that's a really cool aspect of the course, and that's something that if you have tried intuitive eating on your own, or maybe you've listened to the podcast and thought it sounded cool and started you know, experimenting with it, but not really had a lot of success, this is one area that I think could really help you turn a corner. I also, in the course, share my secrets to making food and exercise choices from a place of self-care rather than self-control, and I teach you how to stop alternating between restriction and binging, which, if anyone has ever felt like they might be addicted to food, that is often at the root of it. So in the course, we really work through getting over that hump of the restrict binge cycle and how to just be a little more on an even keel with food. So the course has a lot of great multimedia content, and as one person who just finished the course said, very well done. It's so supportive, challenging, and thought-provoking. I liked the multidisciplinary approach with external readings, podcasts, written texts, and downloads. And then beyond that, I also have a private Facebook group in the course that's exclusively for participants, and that's where people can go and support each other and also get sort of real-time feedback from me and from two wonderful coaches that I have working with me to help moderate the Facebook group. So it's a pretty lively group, and a lot of people have gotten a lot of support there and been really wonderful with each other. It's, it's a great community to join. So when you purchase the course, you'll get access to that exclusive group. And you'll also get a monthly Q&A podcast that I do for the course. 
So that's for people to submit their questions, either, you know, maybe they're not a part of the Facebook group, they don't like Facebook, or they just want a more in-depth answer to questions than, than we could provide in the group. So they submit their questions there, and that's where you can really get individualized attention for anything that comes up for you in the course. And I answer those questions in an exclusive monthly Q&A podcast. It's really meaty. It's like an hour and change long. So it's like the length of one of these food psych episodes, but just me answering your questions. So it's a lot of really individual attention for a group course. So you can learn more about the course and sign up at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. And then finally, another way you can support the podcast is to help us reach more people by leaving a great rating and review in iTunes. Just open up iTunes on your computer or the podcast app on your phone, type in Food Psych to the little search bar, click on the result that comes up under podcasts, and then go to the ratings and reviews tab and you can leave your rating and review there. And I'm so grateful for the nice ratings and reviews that you guys have all left because they really help us get the word out about food psych and the body positive message and bring this into people's ears. So if this podcast has helped you in your journey and making peace with food, please pay it forward and leave us a nice rating and review so that you can help others get there too. All right. So without any further ado, let's go talk to Marcy Evans. I spoke with her via Skype from her home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Oh, Christy, I am such a fan of your podcast. And so I have listened to, I don't even know how many episodes knowing and anticipating this question. It's been really fun and interesting for me to kind of take a walk down memory lane as I've been anticipating our conversation. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's been really fun. And I actually wanted to start out with my relationship to food as a baby. And it's it's interesting because there's some folklore around what I was like as a baby as it relates to food, because, you know, my mom tells me I was really different than my brother. I have an older brother. And she said, you know, when he was young as a baby and as, an, as a toddler, he'd get up and really just want to play for a while and kind of do his own thing. And she said, you know, Marcy, not you you wanted to get up and the first thing you wanted to do was eat. You didn't want to play. You didn't want to sort of, you know, kind of hang out. You wanted to eat. And I feel like that just is such a perfect story to, to kind of lead in and tell listeners about myself that I've always been oriented around food. I've always been interested in food. I've always loved to eat. I've always had a pretty big appetite and I've never been picky. So one of the other kind of funny stories of, of when I was little is I had this habit of when I really liked what I was eating, I would hum and the humming would get faster and louder <laughs> the more I liked what it was, what I was eating. So we have this footage from when it was like my first birthday and I was eating chocolate cake and you hear this humming that was just growing and getting louder. <laughs> And it was really fun because as I got older, you know, as like a little kid, two, three, four, five, I would still do my humming thing. So my parents, you know, they'd want to like take us out to a restaurant and usually it would draw some sort of attention because there I'd be sort of like sitting in my high chair in my seat, just like loving my food, going to town, humming away. And people were like, what is going on with that kid? <laughs> I eventually grew out of it, but it was really funny for me to kind of think back on those on those early moments. That's hilarious. I love that. So you were too little to know what the humming was about. It was just like something you did to convey pleasure. Yeah, it was just something that I did. And it was just like joy and pleasure. And it was like if I was that my family knew if I really liked what I was eating because I just expressed it. It was like I just couldn't be happier. I was so content doing my thing. That's so cool. I love that. I know. I love thinking back to like my youngest self who, you know, couldn't be self-conscious or have any sort of judgment that there was just this natural joy around food and, you know, makes me think about, you know, certainly what we talk about as intuitive eating and health at every size dietitians, this sort of natural innate wisdom. Maybe we'll get to this later in the podcast, but I think a lot about some of the food addiction stuff that I've gotten interested in looking into and how you know, the reality is food is meant to be pleasurable. We are meant to enjoy it. And that is actually healthy. We know 
something has gone awry when we have adverse reactions to normative eating. You know, that's what we see in the brain scans of people with anorexia, you know, that we're, we're meant to have joyous, positive reactions chemically in our brains in response to food. So I just think those sort of early baby years really capture that in such a kind of funny way. I know, totally. And that's that's exactly, I, I really do want to get into that because the food addiction stuff is fascinating. And when, you, when taken from the perspective of an intuitive eater, it's like, well, duh, of course food is pleasurable. Of course it's lighting up these pleasure centers in the brain, you know? Right. It's evolutionarily protective, right? To, to bring us back to food. So we're, you know, perpetuating our species is really what it comes down to. Yeah. Oh, I want to, I want to get into that so much more, but you know, for your story, for the beginning, we can talk about, you know, kind of what that joy in food, how that lasted or didn't last throughout your childhood. I'm curious. Right. I mean, fortunately, my childhood with food was just really not a big deal. I am really fortunate. I grew up with particularly a mom. She was much more a part of my food modeling, I think even more so than my dad, because she stayed at home with us. But she, my mom is naturally quite petite. So she was never preoccupied about the need to lose weight or feeling that she needed to lose weight. So she had a very easy relationship to food. And so we had a kitchen where all sorts of foods fit. We had fruits and vegetables. We had balanced, helpful family meals. And we even had family meals that, you know, now as a dietitian kind of crack me up. You know, one of my favorite things that my mom made was like chicken Dorito casserole. It's like lots of casseroles with like that cream of chicken soup, which is just funny because we don't necessarily think of that as particularly healthful. And again, I really wasn't picky. You know, I have some really funny memories of, you know, maybe I was six or seven years old and in the morning I'd get up and get my frozen Eggo waffles and put it into the toaster. And I remember sitting on the kitchen counter and with the maple syrup, sort of squeezing a dot of maple syrup into every single Eggo waffle hole, getting it like perfectly prepared. You know, I ate school lunches, so I just ate whatever was served in the cafeteria. We had family dinner most nights. You know, we had this kind of little routine in our family where I'd have a bowl of cereal before bed, my brother and I would. And the cereal my parents bought and that we ate were like Lucky Charms and tricks and Cinnamon Toast Crunch. And, you know, it wasn't like the type of family where we were eating Wheaties or something like that. I mean, we got all of those sugar cereals that often my friends would want to come over and eat. You know, oh, my gosh, you're allowed to eat Cocoa Puffs. And it was just so not a big thing. That's just what was in the cupboard. You know, I have memories of like, gosh, two dollars out of my mom's wallet and going down the street to thrifties. Like my favorite thing to do is I would pick out two candy bars, a Slim Jim and Funyuns and sit down in one of the aisles and take out the magazines and flip through the magazine, sort of like read my magazines and eat my junky food. And it was just, it was no big thing. I mean, we had a, you know, I'm kind of given some of these funny anecdotes, but I ate all sorts of food and it really wasn't really moralistic I just kind of enjoyed it. But it wasn't until adolescence that things started to get a little bit funky. I had begged and begged and begged my parents to sign me up for dance lessons. And dance became my whole life. I mean, I loved it. I mean, there was nothing that made me happier. Like for Christmas, I would ask for more dance lessons. And I started because I had always been kind of a skinny kid and I had a natural body shape that worked in the kind of dance arena. I didn't have to try to have a body that the dance instructors, you know, were kind of wanting their dancers to look like. I just kind of easily had a body that was naturally that way. But I started to develop an awareness of sort of the culture in the dance world of things that you should and shouldn't eat, particularly in my ballet community, which was different than kind of my jazz dance community. And so I started to kind of like look around at the older ballerinas. And so it was like, okay, well, they don't eat the pizza. I eat the pizza. So I should probably hide the fact that I'm eating the pizza. I remember being at the dance studio and someone had given me, one of my little friends had given me a gift and there was sort of chocolates inside this mug and I accidentally dropped it and the chocolate rolled out and and everybody saw it. And I remember being mortified, like this awareness of like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have this food. 
So things started to be, you know, develop an awareness in my mind of like, what is good, what is bad, but my eating remained, you know, pretty balanced. And it wasn't until my teen years. And it was interesting because I was thinking about, you know, sharing my story and I had kind of forgotten about this experience, but I was going to my primary care doctor and just for a regular annual exam and, you know, started out with weighing me. And which had never been a big thing for me up until that point. I had never, I don't think ever really thought about it, but I remember seeing a number and being shocked. It was like this number that I thought, how is it possible that I could weigh this much? And it completely, it was as if I had sort of kind of entered this zone of like, disbelief. It was like the whole world had gone somehow like flipped on its head. And I was really kind of freaking out inside. And, um, I remember laying there for the exam and the doctor was, you know, really nice. And he said, Oh, you know, you have this kind of natural long lean build, are you in track or do you run cross country? And I remember thinking to myself, what is he talking about? Like, he knows how much I weigh, like, I have somehow become huge and I was completely just like, what is happening to me? And I wish I had vocalized this to my mom or to someone. I sort of just kept it all inside of me. And it was like, I've got to fix this. This is a real problem. And I don't know what it was about that number or what I was sort of expecting to see, but clearly what I was experiencing was normative puberty. I was growing, I was developing, there was nothing that was wrong, but I had just thoroughly convinced myself that I had a a major problem on my hands. And so I began becoming more aware of my eating and sort of like tightening the reins in such a way where I, I really just tried to be very quote unquote healthy and became sort of the friend who was known to be a very healthy eater. And I became very interested, you know, in nutrition and nothing got terribly crazy. Gratefully in the next year or so, I, I, you know, kind of tried to count calories and I tried to drink slim fast, but none of it really stuck. I look back and it was kind of funny. I checked out a book in the library about the zone diet because I had some awareness somehow that Jennifer Aniston did the zone diet. And so I was like, I'm going to do that. And I read the book and I went to the grocery store and I literally bought like cottage cheese and turkey slices. And I couldn't even do it for one day. (laughs) Like I couldn't, I couldn't make it one day. I was like, this is disgusting. I was actually always quite unsuccessful in my attempts, my like one attempt to diet and to be restrictive. But you know, the, all of the thinking about the restriction and sort of these kind of random half-hearted attempts at restriction really threw me for a loop, you know, so became a little bit more preoccupied, certainly nothing that I ever talked about with my friends, or I don't even think that my family had any sort of awareness of what was happening for me internally. And I even became aware that I had a couple of friends. I found out that they had bulimia, that they had been throwing up. And I was just like, oh no, you know, this is horrible. I was so shocked. And I really didn't identify any of kind of the disordered patterns that I was engaging in. It really just felt like I'm just being healthy. Yeah, because it's so normalized in our society, right? Totally. It really wasn't so outside the realm of what I think many teenage girls begin to experience at that time when they're sort of feeling a little bit out of control in their bodies. It's just very normative. So what started happening is my senior year of high school, I started to have moments where I felt really out of control with food. And so I was sneaking food. I was, you know, sort of grabbing things from the kitchen and hiding. I would maybe be out with my friends on a Friday or Saturday night and I'd come home and everybody would be asleep and I'd eat, you know, several bowls of cereal. And, you know, I felt disgusted with myself and what am I doing? You know, they weren't necessarily outright binges, but it was very, became very compulsive, really driven by all of the psychological and and physical deprivation I was kind of dipping my toes into. 
So my relationship to food, I mean, I feel very grateful. I think I had a number of risk factors to develop a full-blown eating disorder. I certainly have a lot of the personality traits of perfectionism and sort of this need to please others, fairly sensitive, you know, naturally quite anxious. But I think I had a number of protective factors, certainly in my home with pretty emotionally healthy parents who were very, you know, normal and healthy with their eating. So I I look back and think, oh my gosh, had another factor been different, I think I could have really just fallen down the rabbit hole of an eating disorder. Yeah. I feel sort of kind of fell into enough of the disordered stuff that, you know, by the time I was getting ready to head off to college, I was really freaked out because everybody talks about the freshman 15 and because I had been sort of eating compulsively and sort of sneakily eating food and overeating in moments, I had gained some weight and I was so terrified that going off to college that it was going to amp up and get worse. So when I went off to college, I really went with the intention of being as quote unquote, you know, healthy as possible. And I'd really put some rules into place and was really trying to, again, sort of tighten everything up, of course, completely setting myself up, you know, now now that I have the wisdom of all of these years and all this experience, I look back and I'm like, oh gosh, you know, Mark, this is such a setup, you know, that I spent the first few weeks of my college experience really quite hungry, really very distracted, but feeling kind of relieved that I was sort of, you know, had things under control. And here I was starting my freshman year and majoring in nutrition and interested in health and really feeling like, okay, you know, I've got this. And it was probably a month into college, not a a long time that again, starting to sneakily eat things, run out to the vending machine, sort of hide my favorite big, you know, sugar cookie with the pink frosting and things became, you know, fairly unhinged. And I bet being a nutrition student, you might've also had some shame and stigma added to those moments, right? Because you're like, I should be eating healthy. Oh, I felt just tremendous amounts of shame. I mean, just just tremendous amounts of shame. And I had one roommate and we shared a room together and she was a swimmer. And so she kept a lot of food to snack on and to make sure she was getting enough to eat to fuel her workouts. I, of course, didn't keep any, really any food in in my dorm room as an attempt to sort of keep myself under control. But then I would steal her like granola bars and sort of her snacks. And I was so humiliated And, you know, she confronted me at one point and I just, I lied. She said, you know, Marcy, have you been eating my food? And I said, no, as if anybody else was walking (laughs) into our locked door room to steal her food. Like, like, of course it was me, but I just, I couldn't even tolerate the shame. And she knew I was lying. I knew I was lying. Like it was just totally mortifying. And I remember like looking around my college girlfriends and watching people kind of desperately for cues of what is normal? Like, how should I be eating? And little did I know that the vast majority of people I was comparing myself against, you know, come to find out as we talked about this through the years is they were all struggling with their own disordered eating and nobody knew what the heck they were doing, you know, if not full-blown eating disorders. And so my freshman year, I gained a significant amount of weight, which I felt really humiliated about because I had kind of always carried the reputation of, you know, Marcy has, you know, the quote unquote perfect body or this body that, you know, that people wished that they had. And and I didn't realize it at the time, but I sort of had a lot of my sense of self writing on that. And so to have that sort of torn away from me in this way that I couldn't understand and I couldn't get a handle on was just so humiliating. I remember going home to see my family and I didn't want to go home. I I did not want anyone to see me because my body had really changed. And one of the most helpful things for me was after my freshman year of college, I actually went and lived with an aunt of mine. And she had, I think, her own history of of weight fluctuations. And she was just so unconditionally kind and loving. And, you know, I would kind of talk to her and she would just say, 
Marcy, you are perfect just the way that you are. You are beautiful. You are amazing. You're talented. And so sure, there wasn't any of this messaging of, yeah, I understand what you mean. You know, here's a tip or here's what worked for me. She just was like, you're amazing. You're perfect. You're fabulous. And I just feel like that is exactly what I needed in that time was to have someone who was just so unconditionally kind and just saw the best in me. Yeah. And yeah, it's sort of model body acceptance for you without right. it being sort of a formal thing. It's so lucky that she, with her whole history of dieting and weight fluctuation, came to that herself, you know, it sounds like, or at least was able to offer that to you. She was really, really able to offer it to me. And interestingly, you know, she was very into clothes and shopping and I was too, but I had no money. I mean, I was basically broke. Of course, you know, college freshman, I had very little money and many of my clothes didn't fit me well and going shopping became this stressful thing. And it just sort of felt like I was in this body that I just like, just felt so foreign And so she would let me wear her clothes. We weren't really super dissimilar in size. And so I would, you know, before work every morning, I was actually working at a firm that she worked at. She got me this job and, you know, I could go borrow her skirts or borrow her top. And it was like, I had a way of kind of getting myself together and to be able to sort of be okay enough with how and kind of where I was at at that time, even though I was really still really struggling Then I enter my sophomore year of college and things are, you know, kind of hectic still with my eating, but I think settling down a little bit, I think time with my aunt helped me to kind of move out of such kind of big fluctuations between restriction and overeating and for settling in a little bit, but I was, I was still trying to kind of get back in quote unquote in control and And it was funny. I actually had this really funny memory. I had this roommate, a really good friend of mine, and she also really struggled her freshman year with her eating. And we were both nutrition majors at the time. And we actually went to this party where there was a bunch of food and we ended up spending the whole time together at the party, sort of standing around the food table and eating all food and then going back to our nutrition studies and feeling really stuffed. And we were reading this chapter in which it was sort of like behavioral techniques to, to managing eating. And it said, for instance, if you go out where there's social eating, don't stand right next to the food table. And we looked at each other, just started cracking up. Like were like these nutrition majors. And we were like, oh my gosh. Like I remember having to do like the food analysis. Oh God. Yeah. I totally lied. I mean, I was like, are you kidding me? I'm not writing down what I'm eating. Like this is not what a nutrition student should be eating, you know, like totally lied. But what ended up happening, this is just like, I feel like such grace my sophomore year is that I, I really started to reflect and I said, you know what? everything that I'm doing to try to sort of start fresh or get things under control or whatever is really throwing me off and it's not working. And I just need to stop. And I just need to let myself eat and think back to how I used to eat. And, you know, I was again, studying nutrition and my nutrition program was very good about talking about balance and moderation and all foods really do fit. So I was like, I've just got to stop all of this. And I, you know, went back to doing exercise that I really loved and doing dancing. And I feel like I, I sort of stumbled into my own version of giving myself permission with eating and intuitive eating. And as I sort of made my way through college, my eating really normalized. I mean, I was actually quite balanced And just things started to get a lot better once I stopped trying to control. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's a testament to probably how nutrition was taught in your program. But also, I wonder, like, that experience with your aunt where you just felt this unconditional acceptance of you and your body and, you know, didn't feel judged for what you were doing with food. That sounds like it really set you off on the right foot. I totally agree. I totally agree. And I think it probably had these ripple effects sort of down the line that I didn't even realize it at the time, you know, because I still was quite uncomfortable with my body. And I remember being at this like step aerobics class, which I loved. It was so fun. And I remember seeing myself in the mirror and not liking what I was seeing. And I said to myself, you know what, Marcy, 
I don't know whether or not my body's going to go back to how it used to be. It might not, but exercise, have a good time. It's going to kind of be what it's going to be. Like you can't just keep trying to control this. And it's really interesting because then I got accepted into a dietetic internship. It was in Southern California and I had the opportunity to do a rotation at an eating disorder facility. And my assignment while I was there was to read intuitive eating. And I was reading this book and I was like, oh my gosh, I kind of did my own version of this in a way. I mean, not exactly, but sort of. And so of course it resonated because it had reflected my own experience of sort of pulling myself out of this sort of crazy tunnel that I had been in for about three years. Right. That's amazing. Oh, it was totally amazing because then it gave structure and form to what I had been thinking and sort of figuring out. I mean, at that time, my relationship to food, I mean, things were still, it wasn't as if I was just sort of this Zen. I don't want to give, give that idea to listeners that I sort of just figured it out on my own and everything was perfect. No, I mean, I was still a little bit tweaky, a little bit preoccupied, a little bit compulsive, a little bit, you know, still kind of going down to the pantry and what am I doing here? I mean, I would still work in my process when I was in my dietetic internship and it was definitely still effortful. And I was certainly still spending too much time thinking and worrying about food in my body. Oh yeah. I feel you on that. Like I've said on the podcast before, when I started this podcast three and a half years ago, I was still thinking of myself as someone who had a sort of funky relationship with food. You know, I didn't sort of understand what normal eating was yet. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I would say it took years for all of the bumps to get ironed out. And that's one of the things I think I've, one of the reasons I've been developed, able to develop, I think a lot of empathy and compassion for my clients and the amount of time it takes to heal from the physical and psychological deprivation. And I feel like my experiences with food, while I didn't necessarily have a full-blown eating disorder, it was enough of the craziness to really inform the work that I do today on such a lived level. I actually am able to look back now and really feel like it was a gift for the work that I was ultimately meant to do. Yeah, I completely understand that. Yeah, I just feel like, I mean, anybody who's ever heard me speak, I make the joke that I'm a one trick pony. Like I do eating disorders work. I do intuitive eating work. I do health at every size work. And it is what I'm passionate about. And I feel like it's what I'm here for in terms of my professional calling. And I, I feel a lot of gratitude for those years of profound confusion and turmoil and unhappiness and chaos because it really helps me to be with, I feel like my clients as going their own struggle, even if it might not be the exact same experience, I feel like in ways I can relate. Absolutely. And I, I love, I think the elements of your experience have such like meaning for how we deal with disordered eating and people's relationships with their bodies, because it's like, you definitely had thin privilege just by your genetics, you know, and sort of you were given a nice model of how to eat in your family. So it was never an issue. And yet this thin ideal of the dance world that you were in and the disordered practices of, of the people around you and the sort of idea that like your body was changing and you had to control it, that comes from outside, right? Like that wasn't modeled in your family. That was the culture. And that's such an important piece of why this work, you know, in my mind, and I know in yours too, we've talked about this before, like eating disorder recovery work has to go hand in hand with health at every size and body positivity and intuitive eating. Like it's just, you can't have eating disorder recovery and weight management, you know, it doesn't work that way. Absolutely. I agree with you 1000%. You absolutely cannot. I mean, you have to have all of those pieces coming together in order to truly get to a place of self-acceptance and peace. You know, I was really fortunate to sort of stumble my way through it. And then I very early on in my career, I think with intuitive eating sort of opened up a whole new world of, of books that had been written, you know, and my next book was moving away from diets. And then my next book after that was overcoming overeating. And then there was rethinking thin by Gina Colada. And I just 
immersed myself in all of this. And it was like, I can never go back. You know, I've got to find a way to be able to do work that allows me to integrate all of this. It was sort of like, you know, I was listening to your episode with Aaron and I thought it was so funny when he talked about sort of the matrix, you know, you (laughs) you, you sort of enter in there. And one of the things that I think about, and I know that you mentioned, you know, several dietitians, many dietitians listen to this podcast is to, it's okay as a dietitian for you to also be on your own path, not just in your personal relationship to food, but also in your professional work that you're doing, that we all have our own process of sort of how we were educated and taught to think about what our role is. And then you evolve and you sort of have to think about how do I shake off some of this stuff and fully embrace intuitive eating and health at every size? And I think that there's, it's difficult because many dietitians try to straddle both worlds and it's incredibly dissonant and it's incredibly uncomfortable and it feels wrong because as you were saying, it is wrong. You can't be trying to do the weight management, control what you're eating and simultaneously work in the world of weight neutrality and body acceptance and intuitive eating. And so, you know, eventually I sort of found my way through it and through my private practice, I'm able to freely do the work that feels ethical and kind and health promoting. And I am feel really grateful for that. Yeah, private practice is such a blessing in that way because I think it's hard to find, you know, unless you're in one of those communities. Like, I mean, you're in Boston, and I feel like every time I talk to Boston dietitians, I'm like, yes, like this whole community seems to get it because it's like a very strong health at every size influence there. So, you know, maybe there are group practices there that people can join. I know Lisa, our mutual colleague, has one of them. So it's like, certain pockets of the country or the world maybe have these opportunities. But otherwise, like even if you're working in an eating disorder treatment center, unfortunately, a lot of the time, they don't have that foundation and that rootedness in health at every size and body positivity and are trying to straddle the line, you know? So like private practice, I think is kind of the way to go for a lot of people who want to truly be a hundred percent health at every size and body positive. Although that being said, I, I feel like I see a lot of both dietitians and health coaches and you know wellness coaches and all those sorts of allied fields that do try to straddle the line because of marketing, because they want to come up in searches for like weight loss or what's a diet that's actually going to work, you know? And so they try to like capture that audience. And I was just talking with someone this morning who pitched me about being on the podcast, who's a listener and like really fantastic, you know, seems like she's doing fantastic work. But I was talking with her about like how just having any sort of weight focused language really undermines the message because it's holding out the promise that you will lose weight if you, you know, it's basically making intuitive eating another diet. I couldn't agree more. And I think that, you know, I'm simultaneously thrilled that there is more conversation around body acceptance and health at every size and intuitive eating more so than ever before. But I'm also simultaneously worried in that I think that we're going to have to be more and more skilled about how we teach our clients and how our clients are able to be smart consumers. Because of course, there are going to be people who sort of capture this message because it's popular and, you know, use it to sell whatever. I think Social K is a perfect example of that. You know, I think that they've done a number of commercials that sort of trick people in, you know, to thinking, you know, that they're all about body acceptance. Of course they're not. They make really crappy diet food. Mm -hmm. And same with Weight Watchers too. It's like now they're jumping on the body positive bandwagon. And it's like, it's literally in the name, you guys. You can't have body positivity and be watching your weight. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's, it can be really, really tricky. And I think that I certainly went through my own evolution for sure in the years of my private practice of sort of how do I use language around weight and weight management? I mean, I even kind of struggle with that term. I don't use it personally idea of weight management. And I think that there are probably a lot of really wonderful people who fully utilize a health at every size philosophy, but maybe have on their marketing materials, weight management. Oh yeah. I used to, my definition of it was like, well, you know, you can manage your feelings about your weight. You know, that's how I sort of squared it in my head with a health at every size approach. And I was like, and it'll sort of capture the people who are who are actually needing to hear this health at every size message if they're concerned about their weight. But over the years, I've realized that 
A, like in working with clients who are on the fence like that, it actually isn't super fulfilling because oftentimes they're not quite ready to give up the diets completely and give up the pursuit of weight loss completely. And I think that readiness to change is so important in like whatever type of behavior change work you're doing, right? And then also it's like a dog whistle, you know, the term weight management, I think is a dog whistle that sort of calls out to people who are in that diet mindset and turns away people who are in the health at every size world. It's so polarizing. And so I have just subsequently thought like, I'm not going to include anything about that in my marketing materials. And the only way I really mention weight now is to say like, if you're consumed with thoughts about your weight or you're constantly trying to lose weight and like obsessed with your weight or whatever, but I won't say, and I'm very also clear about intuitive eating won't help you lose weight necessarily. Intuitive eating is a weight neutral practice. And some people lose weight, some people gain weight because they've been restricting and they need to gain weight. Some people maintain their weight. Like it's just not predictable. Exactly. And I think that once I've been, at least I can speak for myself, gotten to the place where I can fully accept and fully embrace the approach that I'm utilizing is that it really frees me up. And I'm still, of course, working with people who, of course, they're highly ambivalent about fully embracing a health at every size approach. I mean, I think that that's quite natural and very, very understandable, you know, given the culture that we live in, you know, you sort of sit in my office, my clients talk about being in my office and feeling very clear and then they leave. And then, then they're like this fish swimming upstream. And it's like, is this crazy? Am I, and what am I doing? You know, is this, is this all sort of sounding really nice, but I'm really doing harm to myself. I mean, it can feel very confusing. And so to be very clear as a clinician, about the research and science, as well as just sort of ethically what you're doing. And to be really, really clear as Crystal, I think would really encourage all of the clinicians listening to this to continue your own work so that you can get to a place where you feel really rock solid and really clear about this message because any of your own ambivalence will leak out into the work that you do with your clients and that will cause them harm. Yes. So I think it's just so important that we all continue in our, as clinicians to do our own personal journey and to really, you know, I say to my clients, listen, there are magazines that I don't buy. There are messages that I don't read. There are blogs that I would never go on to, you know, I maintain my own kind of bubble of as much as I can manage it of what allows me to feel good, what supports my overall health and well-being, and what's going to take away from that. You know, I'm I'm just as selective as I encourage my clients to be. So we've all got to be on our own continued process given the culture that we live in. And like we were saying earlier, you know, going to become a little bit more tricky as these things become more popular. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's such a great tip and that's something that I talk with a lot of clients about too is like creating a social media strategy for yourself really that you unfollow and unsubscribe from people who are diet-based thinkers and surround yourself with body positive messages and with people who really get it because the more you expose yourself to that body negative messaging and the you know the culture at large will supply plenty of it without you even having yeah. to choose it right you'll walk past a billboard or you'll you know it's like diet talk at a party or whatever but you know to the extent that you can like you you do have some agency over your environment in terms of like the media you consume and so and the t- you know the types of conversations you engage in too i think that's another important piece is like not letting yourself get sucked into diet talk or even with people you're comfortable with being able to assert a different point of view, I think can be really helpful and also healing for the people you're talking with even. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's all such a process and to really, you know, give yourself permission to be in your own process wherever you're at. And one of the things that I just think is so interesting is that as individuals evolve in their own process in their relationship to food and body. One, just like you were saying, and I wanted to come back to this because I think it's so important is that it's, we can't predict what's going to happen to a person's body, whether they'll lose weight, maybe their weight won't change, maybe they'll gain weight. And I think it's really important for people to really know that any of those three are a possibility. This isn't about controlling or making your body do something. And as you begin to be able to develop acceptance around that process, that it begins to really trickle out into these other areas of your life. And one of the things that it might disrupt is other relationships and other environments. And then you start making some potentially difficult decisions around that. It's certainly a harder 
but vastly more rewarding and sustainable process than dieting for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did you have any experience with that personally? Like once you started to walk this path of intuitive eating and learn more about why it's detrimental to diet and you can't go back, did you have to sort of renegotiate your friendships or your colleague relationships or things like that? You know, it was interesting because it happened at a time where my personal life was so much in flux because I was I was moving through like three to four different states at the time because of what I had with graduating college and doing my dietetic internship and then moving on to grad school. So I didn't necessarily have to make massive shifts in any relationships, but I did have to become, I think, more selective in what I would engage in in terms of just certain conversations and gaining confidence over time of maybe asserting myself a little bit more or my my viewpoint a little bit more. I'm also, I think, fortunate and in this way, very different from most of my clients in that I do this professionally. And so I'm so out there with my messaging of what's on my website and what's on my blog and what's on my YouTube that most people at this point in my personal life, they know what it's all about. Right, right. Yeah. Nobody has to sort of question uh, or you don't get a lot of questions probably about like, how can I lose the weight? Yeah, it happens still at times in very obnoxious ways, you know, whether I'm sitting on an airplane or, you know, meeting someone who's a friend of a friend. I often am like, oh, I'm just going to say I'm a counselor. I'm just not even going to mention the word nutrition because I don't want to talk with them about what they're putting on their plate or, oh, you know, they get really nervous about having me over for dinner, developing a new friendship and, oh, you know, I've got this dietitian coming. I said, no, 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 no. There's nothing I don't eat. Whatever you serve will be fine. I don't have any allergies. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a sort of great way to just subtly put the message out there too, that like good nutrition practice doesn't require you to cut out huge groups of food or anything like that. It's just you can eat whatever you want and you're cool with it. And I think that that helps other people to hear that. Right. And also that you don't actually have to know the minutia of what is in your food. I had this hilarious experience when I was a brand new eating disorder dietitian. I was covering a maternity leave and I was doing my first group. So this group of clients who were at a treatment facility for an eating disorder, and they were asking me these questions of, well, what is an exchange for this? Or what counts as this? Or if I was to eat this, how would I count it? And I didn't know. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so embarrassed that as the sort of the expert in the room, I don't know. And so I was sort of pawning the questions off to the other girls in the room. And of course, often the person who had the greatest (laughs) eating disorder symptoms at the time were like able to answer those questions in a flash. And so I was sort of like giving the answers by sort of passing it out to the other members. And I had to supervisor. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I need to be better prepared. I need to memorize this exchange list. And she said, Marcy, I think it's so great. She goes, that's actually fantastic modeling and what you're showing. And if you can sort of be more open about this next time is that you don't have to actually be that precise. People with eating disorder histories or dieting histories, they're used to looking at their food with such a microscope that everything's a calorie count or a point or a exchange or whatever. And that, you know, unless you have some type of medical condition that requires it, you really do not need to watch your food with that degree of minutia that our bodies tolerate actually a fairly significant degree of flexibility and variability. Absolutely. That's really cool. I like that story a lot because it's true that people really are stuck on the details of food the more disordered they are or the longer you've spent in the diet mentality, right? That's such a such a manifestation of it. I get asked sometimes too, like, what are your thoughts on, I don't know, some food additive that I've never heard of? And I'm like, I have no freaking clue, you know? Like, I don't know. I don't follow that stuff because that's not what's important about food. You know, the there's a lot of fringe nutrition blogs and media and stuff out there that kind of sees on these tiny little details. And as a member of the nutrition media, I know that it's because editors need a new angle and new, you know, everybody needs the hot new story. Like that is what keeps the media going is a new take or a new topic or something new you should be afraid of. And fear really sells. They've done research on how the emotions in headlines and what gets clicked on more, what gets read more. And it's like the fear-based ones get clicked and read. Like that's just, you know, isn't that horrible? (laughs) 
horrible. That is why I have a very long wait list in my group practice, Christy. And I, that is my mission <laughs> is to, is to change that. Gosh. So it's actually interesting that you say that. That is so fascinating. Just yesterday, I got an email from a journalist from Boston magazine. And she said, Hey, you know, Marcy, I'm doing this article on like, what is the worst food you could eat during the holidays? Oh. You know? And she gave some examples and she said, you know, would you like to be quoted now historically, because I was sort of like, you know, so careful about responding and really not knowing how to interact with the media. I would just respond and say, you know, this really isn't my type of story. Here's what I do do for future reference. And so I've actually, I think gotten a little bit more training, a little bit more comfort in working with the media. And I wrote back and I said, you know, I really don't believe in demonizing foods. My response to that question would be the food that is maybe the quote unquote worst or whatever. I can't remember how I framed it was the food that you don't enjoy. And to really sort of tap into, I said, there's a lot of food during the holidays and to really sort of mindfully notice, do I really like candy canes? You know, do I really like eggnog? Do I really like whatever it is? And to begin to notice it. And I wrote a couple more sentences and I said, I hope this angle might be useful for your story. And she wrote back and she's like, I love that angle. It's fantastic. We'll use your quotes. Nice. And so I was like, yay, you know, it's a, it's a little win. You know, you never know exactly how you're going to get portrayed in an article or in an interview. I'd like to hope there's a little bit more space for learning to think about food in, in not such a fear-based way. And, you know, and maybe that brings us kind of full circle back to that conversation around food addiction. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask. Yeah. I think a lot of the messaging that resonates for people who struggle with the food, the messaging of food addiction, I think is very appealing, or at least it resonates is because it is sort of a fear-based message of you can't be trusted. You are an addict. You know, you need to take these foods out of your life. You need to be abstinent. And for people who have a history of restriction and dieting and disordered eating, their experience with food really bears that out, that they do feel that they can't be trusted. So it's that, that fear-based message, I think really kind of seizes upon a really vulnerable population. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's sort of speaking to people about the thing that they're most ashamed of and the thing that they think is the only problem, which is I'm eating out of control. I feel like like I can't stop and missing all of the destructive or deprivational thoughts that set them up for that. Right. It's like it doesn't doesn't look at the whole system, but it captures this thing that people are afraid of and then takes them in a direction that actually makes it worse. Right. Like that. Right restricts more food. Right. And yeah, I'm curious like what you found in your kind of looking at the research about food addiction, like, because there is scientific research out there that says food addiction is a thing and it has, you know, brain imaging, looking at how reward centers and people's brains light up with particular foods. And so, you know, if you're sort of looking at that from the diet mentality, it could seem like scientific support for this idea of food addiction. But how would you interpret that from a different lens? Right. This is a really, this is a really big topic and a really complicated topic. So I'll share at least, you know, a a few of my thoughts. The first thing I want to say is that food addiction research is in its infancy. So the research currently, and I try to read a lot of the research, I try to be informed as possible, is that the research that's been done on humans has been largely inconclusive. So you have results that sort of validate the theories of food addiction. And then you have results that counter that. And so we don't have actually a lot of human studies and the results aren't consistent at this stage. Another thing that I want to mention is that there has yet to be a formalized definition of food addiction. And so we're using this term that we all are sort of developing our own thought about what it means with no one actually specifically defining it. So are we talking about a specific substance like sucrose? You know, are we talking about a big group of foods? What what does that mean? So that's another thing to know that at this stage, we don't even have a formalized definition for food addiction. So that's a problem. Big problem. Yeah. You know, and another thing just for our listeners to know is that there's been a lot of research on food addiction that's primarily been done in rats. And some of it is very interesting. And I think some of it is worth our studying further. But 
I don't think that we want to go down the road in assuming what we're seeing in studies done on rats is something that we immediately sort of translate into human experience, which happens outside of a cage, outside of a study, and has a host of factors that are far more complicated. So we need to sort of take some of this research in context and be very, very careful not about not extrapolating it out. So those are some of my just sort of big picture thoughts about the food addiction research. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's an it's an area I'm really I'm really really interested in. The other things I'll sort of just kind of throw out for the listeners is to know that as I had mentioned earlier is that food is is meant to be rewarding. And there's nothing pathological about that. We are meant to experience pleasure and to have those responses in the brain so that when it's time to eat again, we are driven and compelled to eat and not get distracted by some other task. And so, yes, we see neuroimaging in which those pleasure centers light up. And it is the same with a lot of other activities. Like we see neuroimaging where those pleasure centers light up when a mom holds and smells her baby. We see those pleasure centers light up when we're listening to music or when we're laughing. And so to not just naturally pathologize the fact that that happens and that that's an occurrence because it's actually meant to happen. The other thing to think about is this concept of Pavlovian conditioning, meaning that if we are sort of anticipating something to happen, we're going to see it happen. And so with food, if we expect, you know, that if I, when I eat this food, I am out of control, that can continue to set us up to sort of have these repeat experiences. Now, neuroimaging research is actually really, really fascinating because what we see in some of the neuroimaging research is that a food that is restrained or restricted has an exaggerated response in those pleasure centers in the brain. And so I, the analogy that I love to give is, you know, think about when you've played with a baby and they're sort of crawling around on the ground and they have all of these toys around them and they see your cell phone. And you take, you see that they've got your eyes on the cell phone. And so you quickly hide your cell phone. Do they want any of this sort of 20 toys laying on the ground? No, they want the cell phone, right? And so, you know, we're no different. We want the thing that's, that's forbidden. And so this catch 22 being the more you say, no, 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 I can't, I shouldn't, don't bad, the more enticing. So that means when we study people's brains and we show things like, you know, cupcakes on the screen, that there's a bigger response to a cupcake than there is to maybe an apple. Well, that's a very conditioned response. And so we have to put the neuroimaging research in context of our food beliefs and our food history. Yes. A lot of the studies are using the Yale food addiction scale. Now, Yale food addiction scale is a supposed measure for measuring what might be food addiction in humans. I have a lot of qualms with this scale. And I was actually just two weeks ago at a conference and I asked a couple of questions to the psychiatrist who was giving a talk on food addiction. So my heart rate and my blood pressure were quite high, <laughs> quite <laughs> getting like very, very revved. And so I, I asked her, I said, you know, I just want to clarify. I said, it's my understanding that the food addiction scale does not account for food restriction. And she said, that's correct. And so I wasn't able to follow up, but I wanted to say, how is it possible that the food addiction scale can measure any degree of food addiction, if we aren't accounting for restriction and restraint, when we know by the neurobiological research, that creates a draw to the food, a heightened response to that food, and a likely an experience of eating that food that feels more out of control or chaotic if it has been restricted. Yes. Yes. That is awesome. So- any of you researchers using the food addiction scale or have validated it, please answer this question for me because it is such a massive, massive problem with this scale. And it's treated in the research as sort of the gold standard. The other thing that I mentioned for, for the eating disorder, either people who are suffering from an eating disorder or eating disorder clinicians is that the scale has not been utilized or validated for people with active eating disorders. 
Not to mention they haven't differentiated sub-threshold eating disorders. Which the research shows are very high. You know, it's like some studies show 75% of women have some form of disordered eating or eating disorder. So three quarters of the population, right? Of the female population. Yeah. (laughs) Gosh. So if we were to say, okay, maybe let's test this scale out when we have full recovery and we've healed all of the wounds from dieting, restriction, eating disorders, could this then be an indicator of perhaps the very, 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 very small subset of the population who have an actual chemical addiction to food? Maybe. But I am I am in no way sold on this being a useful or valid tool until we this piece out. So I do want to validate that people experience have experiences with food that feel like addiction, that feel out of control, that feel compulsive, and that is real. And I don't want to to diminish or invalidate that. But what is borne out by the research as well as my clinical experience is that as we learn how to safely introduce food, get reacclimated, give permission, get nutritionally repleted, is that the feelings that feel like addiction. I mean, I have clients who say to me, Marcy, when I eat X, Y, and Z, it literally feels like I'm high. But when we go through that process, the feeling of addiction dissipates over time. So I hold this idea of food addiction very lightly. I want to respect my client's experience of what feels like addiction. I want to, I want to validate what makes them feel vulnerable to overeating on food and respect that and work around it. But I think the concept of food addiction can, for some people, and certainly not all people, cause them to feel less capable of developing a different relationship with food. And I would hate for that to be the case because for the vast majority of people, certainly every client I've ever worked with, we've been able to get them to a better place than where they start you know, when they begin their journey. And so I feel very hopeful about people being able to heal their relationship with food. And I feel worried about the concepts of food addiction for some people being something that causes them to feel disempowered. Oh, I a hundred percent agree with that. And that's also been my experience with clients is like people will come to me after being in a 12 step group for some sort of self-defined food addiction because they feel out of control around food. And they, you know, that was the, the thing that sort of best describe to them what their behaviors were. So they got involved with a 12-step group, proceeded to restrict a bunch more foods and have to like send a food plan to their sponsor or express remorse if they ate something not on their food plan or all these very shaming sort of approaches that made them feel worse and worse about themselves. And then finally, they sort of in whatever path they take, you know, get a diagnosis of an eating disorder or get sort of tuned into the idea of intuitive eating and subsequently, you know, come work with me or come work with fellow clinician and develop such a healthy relationship with food that they can look back on and say, oh my gosh, two years ago, I thought that I was allergic to sugar and now I eat it every day and I don't feel out of control, you know? So there is really hope, even if people feel in the depths of food addiction right now or feel like they have an addictive relationship with food, it won't always be that way. And you can absolutely heal that. One of the things that I do want to say is that, you know, many people who have experienced feeling out of control and and perhaps would describe themselves as being addicted to food or to sugar is that they have had experiences in the past where they've kind of tried to do the Janine Roth style of give yourself permission, fill yourself up, buy all the food, surround yourself with the food, give yourself permission. And and I do want to say that I actually really disagree with this approach because what tends to happen is that because people haven't developed the skill, and I think of eating as a skill of being able to sort of have those foods in a way that feels balanced and that feels moderate, is that they tend to sort of go on a bender for several days where they're just really binging, binging, binging. And then they're sort of like, the proof is in the pudding. Look what just happened. I gave myself permission. 
I was out of control. Like it's, it's just true. And so I love that you're doing like your intuitive eating online support group. And I think for people who have maybe tried to do intuitive eating on their own and have maybe felt like it's not going so well that to work with an intuitive eating specialist, because there are ways to go about the permission giving that doesn't have to reinforce the feelings of being out of control and, you know, proving that they can't be trusted or maybe gaining unnecessary amounts of weight because they've attempted and done their very best. And so it kind of undermines the idea of, of permission because they're going about it in a way innocently and not meaning to, that really is a bit of a setup to just continue to feel out of control. So knowing that there, there are techniques and ways to go about it that will help you to feel less out of control in the process. And I think most importantly, more capable, more competent, which is ultimately how we want our clients to feel is more capable. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That is such a great point. And I think that is one reason I developed the intuitive eating online course is because I felt like, you know, I had people coming to me in private practice saying, I read the intuitive eating book. I tried to put it into practice and I just, all I did was binge, you know, because their read on it was basically, or they sort of didn't get much farther than this, the concept of like make peace with food and all foods fit and give yourself unconditional permission to eat, which is such an essential part of intuitive eating, but it's, you know, it has to be within this framework and this concept context of like also giving yourself other tools to help yourself feel good and to know it's okay that when you first do re-approach a food that was once off limits, you might still feel a little bit out of control with it, but that will dissipate over time. And that doesn't mean that this food is forever on the bad list, but you know, you sort of maybe need to work systematically with the foods that are giving you trouble so that the hardest food, you know, so that it's not everything all at once that was off limits. And it's not the one food that feels like your sort of bugbear is like the first one you go to, because that will probably and in disappointment or frustration. Exactly. Yeah. I kind of tease with some of my clients. I said, you know, okay, so let's imagine a day where I didn't eat enough for lunch. I was so busy. I skipped an afternoon snack. I go home starving. I'm stressed out. I'm dealing with some insurance, you know, situation. My house is a mess. I don't have dinner ready. And there's a 10 pound bag of peanut M&Ms sitting on the counter. Likely to happen, <laughs> you know? Like, yes. I idea often people feel that they should be able to manage all foods in all situations. It's like, well, when you're vulnerable, you're vulnerable. So let's sort of be thoughtful about setting this up and having some realistic expectations for yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's why honoring your hunger is such an important piece of intuitive eating. It's like the piece that I think a lot of dieters don't want to look at right away and sort of wish would just disappear. <laughs> like, I know that that was my experience in recovering was like, I wanted to make the binges go away and make the emotional eating go away and whatever. But I, I didn't want to look at, yeah, but you're making yourself hungry by eating less than you really need throughout the day. So like, I think that is such an important piece of the setup for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I could talk to you all day, but we we are coming to the end of our time. So thank you so much for, for all of this great stuff. And I think you've given listeners a lot of important tips to think about. So why don't you let us know where people can find you and especially where any clinicians in the audience can find your online course? Absolutely. Well, I just want to say thank you for having me as someone who has just listened and supported and promoted your podcast. You've had so many incredible people come on this podcast. So I thought, oh my gosh, what can I share that will feel meaningful and useful to the listeners? So I hope, I so hope that there's been something in here that has been inspiring or interesting to the people who are listening. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's been absolutely my pleasure. I could talk about this stuff for hours and Christy, we've done it before. We're going to come <laughs> together. Yes. So, I can easily be found online. I my website is marcyrd.com. It's m a r c i r d.com and same for my Twitter and my Facebook. It's at marcyrd.com and and forward slash marcyrd. So you can pretty much get all my info on my website, but I do want to mention, so thanks for bringing it up, Christy. I am 
incredibly passionate about improving the education for dietitians on how to work with clients to develop a healthier relationship to food. And so my first venture into this process is I have developed a five-part online training. It's geared towards dietitians, but truly therapists could take it, physicians, nurses could take it. I actually even had someone reach out to me and say they took it themselves, even though they're not a clinician and actually found it very useful because she doesn't have a dietitian in her area who specializes in eating disorders. And so she took the training for herself, which I thought was so fascinating. That's cool. I know. I was like, bless you. We've got to find you someone. But that you can find the online training via my website, or you can go directly to the platform, which is marcyrd.pivotshare.com. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. So people can easily find that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And I've, I've really actually tried to keep the pricing very reasonable because I want students and interns to be able to access the training since one of the things that's just such is such a shame is that we don't receive much, if any, training in our early career unless we seek it out ourselves on, on how to work with people with eating disorders. Certainly nothing about health at every size or intuitive eating. And so I, I really do want it to be accessible. I love that. Thank you so much for providing that resource too, because I think it it really is important to have additional training in this stuff for better or worse. And I, I hope that one day dietetic programs and programs for therapists will integrate some of your training into their curriculum, you know, or something like more of the health at every size training, certainly all over the world. Yeah. Just one quick thing, actually, for people who are wanting a little bit more training, I'm an adjunct faculty through Plymouth State University. They have an eating disorder institute. You can Google it where it's largely online. Part of it is live, but it's designed for people who live all over the world. Actually, Mm. we've had a lot of international and national students. And you take five courses to get a certificate in eating disorder specialization. And I'm actually partnering with the amazing Lisa Pearl to develop a specialized eating disorder dietetic internship here in Boston at Simmons College. Oh, that's so exciting. I'm so glad to hear that. Big stuff in the works. So I'm, I'm trying to do my part, but it's really, really cool, exciting stuff. Oh, I love it. I'll put links to that in the show notes too. That's very awesome that you're offering that. Yay. Well, thank you so much, Marcy, for being here. It's been a pleasure talking with you as always. Oh, pleasure's all mine. Thanks, Christy. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to our guests for being here and to you guys for listening. And we'll be back again next week with another brand new episode. Meanwhile, I'd love to stay in touch. And the best way to do that is via email. So you can go to christyharrison.com slash email to sign up for my VIP list. I'll send you info about new episodes of the podcast as they drop, as well as exclusive sneak previews of new episodes, exclusive giveaways and other special deals on the products and services I offer, special tips on how to make peace with food and learn to trust your body, and a whole lot more. Sign up at christyharrison.com slash email. You can also subscribe via iTunes and leave us a nice rating and review, which is a great way to get the word out about the podcast and help other people find these important messages. Just go to iTunes from your computer or your podcast app, type in Food Psych to the search bar, click on the result that comes up under podcasts, and then click on ratings and reviews, and you can leave a rating and review right there. And I really appreciate all the five-star reviews and wonderful ratings that we've gotten because it's helped us climb really high right now in the rankings. So we're currently in the top 50 of all health podcasts, and that's really cool because we're competing against some of the diet mentality, sort of traditional weight management and body shaming types of messages that I'm trying to fight with this podcast. So we've really started to beat out a lot of the diety voices, and I'd love to continue climbing higher in the rankings to get this message out even further. So please leave us a nice rating and review. It's so very much appreciated. And thanks to everyone who's left reviews so far. The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL, and the track is called Food, used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no work in the kitchen now. Who put you there in that perfect position now? Who just wants your food, and you ain't really beat. Have you ever won?